In the first chapter, it says, now Satan took up against Israel. He stood up against Israel. Now, how in the world is that possible? Because God is supposed to be the God of Israel. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembert. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery. We're going to study the 21st chapter of First Chronicles today. It's going to be fascinating. We're going to look at it in about three minutes time and try to understand all this. Uh, Ryan talked about it yesterday and Corey and Ryan are here. Corey. I'm taking a look at a very important threshing floor in ancient Jerusalem. Ryan? Well, today I'm dealing with yet another apparent Bible contradiction between Chronicles and Samuel, and it's this. First Chronicles 21 says that David paid a man 600 shekels of gold, but 2 Samuel 24 says that it was only 50 shekels of silver. So which is it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Janice? It's Friday. I have a wrap-up question. It's going to be anywhere from 2 Kings chapter 20 through to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. I hope you're ready. First Chronicles 21, 1 through 13. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord the King, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to David. All Israel had one million, one hundred thousand men who drew the sword, and Judah had four hundred and seventy thousand men who drew the sword. But he did not count Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he struck Israel. So David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing, but now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Choose for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you, or else for three days the sword of the Lord, the plague in the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. First Chronicles chapter 21, verses 1 through 13. You know, as we continue on in the passage of First Chronicles, we come to First Chronicles chapter 21. And this is an amazing passage of scripture. We're getting ready to go into Second Chronicles very soon over the weekend. But we will inevitably make mistakes as people. You, you know that, I know that. You know, I'm not saying anything new. But will we admit to those mistakes? Or will we try to justify them? As most people do. There are so many ways that we can instinctively justify ourselves. I've done that many times. We can deceive ourselves so easily. Now, this is one of those reasons that we need to be friends with other Christians. <laughs> I mean, real friends, not yes men friends. People who talk about the real issues and allow each other into their lives. 
Different perspectives help us see the world in different ways. And a true friend can call us out on any of our justifications. We don't have to think the same way about everything in the Bible. As Christians, we have our fundamental doctrines that cannot change the gospel, the deity of Christ, Christ's death and his resurrection. But it can be very helpful to be close to a Christian and have some different views than you or I do on different, different peripheral topics. Now, this challenges us not only to think outside of ourselves, but also to understand that we aren't perfect. And we aren't, we aren't God. God wants us to think more like him, to obey him wholeheartedly. And often this involves listening to outside perspectives. Now, if David had listened to the advice of uh, Joab and abandoned his senses, he would have not sinned against God. Think about that. Joab, of all people. Joab? Really? Joab, the, the one who, you know, killed Absalom, David's son? Really? Yeah. I mean, we need to think this through because God is using this to teach us a very, very important lesson. Now take your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. And if you don't have a Bible guide, we'll send you one. Simply call us or write to us. Call us in Canada or the U.S. or write to us. And uh, I would thank you in advance for your donations. They help us to send it to you and print it and get it to you. And then another way you can do this is by Bible Discovery TV. Bible Discovery TV is uh, our website. You can go there and click on the Bible guide. It'll take you to a donate page. And when you get to that donate page, I want to thank you for your donations. Let me say, donations help us. And uh, they go directly to this program. You know, that's what it does. And uh, it just keeps us alive. So we thank you for partnering with us. Today, we need to pray. And as we do so, let's ask the Lord to show us his way. Father, we pray that you would show us your way. Now, Lord, there are many times we think we're right. Probably right now we think we're always right. But we're not. You're always right, Lord. So what we need to do is hear from your Holy Spirit. We need your Holy Spirit to speak to us as we read your words. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' wonderful name. And we said together, amen. Let's look at 1 Chronicles 21. This is amazing. And I like how this statement begins. It says, now Satan stood up. He stood up. Satan stood up against Israel. Look at that line. Satan stood up against Israel. And moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab, the leaders of the people, and to the leaders of the people, I want you to go and number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. Verse 3. And Joab answered, listen to what Joab said. May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord the king... Are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? Now, David was motivated by Satan to count the people of Israel. We should always consider God's plans when developing our own opinions. We live in a world that promotes free speech and free society. I can think how I want to think, be what I want to be. Hold on a minute. If we are Christian, we need to pray and ask God to teach us how to think. Ask the Lord to put in our minds the things that he wants there, not the things that we want there. I think I'll just leave that one. We'll go on to the scripture because this gets very, very interesting. All right, let's read on. Nevertheless, the king's word prevented or prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and went throughout all of Israel and came to Jerusalem. Then Joab gave David the sum number of the people. All of Israel had 1,100,000 men who drew the sword and Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not count Levi and Benjamin among them. For the king's word was abominable. Listen to that. 
The king's word was abominable to Joab. Joab reluctantly fulfilled David's request. The census numbered over 1.5 million swordsmen. God knows all things. It is not important that we know all things. God knows all things. Not important that we know all things. And I think that's really important today as we look at what's happening with, in the West, we have elections and everything else taking place. We don't need to know everything, but we do know God who does know everything. Nobody in this world knows everything. Some people are relatively smart, but they don't know everything. But God who sees every person understands every move. He knows everything. Let's pray to him and ask him to teach us what to do. All right, let's go into the scripture. It says, and God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he struck Israel. So David said to God, I've sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Then the Lord spoke to Gad, that's David's seer, saying, go and tell David, saying, thus says the Lord. I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said, Thus says the Lord, choose for yourself. Either three years of famine, three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword or enemies overtaking you, or else for three days, the sword of the Lord, the plague of the land, with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. David wisely repents and puts himself into the hand of God. You see, beloved, Jesus has forgiven our sins. We must live in confession and repentance to God. Beloved, beloved of God, that's what that word means. We must live in repentance to God. Father, help us today to understand what happened here and what you're telling us. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ today that we would not be sidetracked by our own ideas, but we would be directed by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come into our hearts, come into our life today and teach us your way and show us your path as we look at Zechariah and learn about the future. Help us to hear what you're saying in the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, amen and amen. Today I'm continuing my study from yesterday on 1 Chronicles 21, and today we have a new problem to solve, and the problem is that 1 Chronicles 21 says that King David paid a man 600 gold shekels. But back in 2 Samuel 24, which is recording the same event, it says that David only paid him 50 silver shekels. So the question is, which is it? Well, the answer is in the details. Although the Bible proclaims to be God's flawless word, there appears to be a major discrepancy between the parallel accounts of 2 Samuel 24 and 1 Chronicles 21. In 2 Samuel 24 verse 24, David pays a man 50 shekels of silver for his threshing floor and the oxen, which he repurposes into an altar for a sacrifice to the Lord. But then in 1 Chronicles 21 verse 25, it says that David paid the same man 600 shekels of gold for the place. So according to Samuel, David paid only 50 shekels of silver, but Chronicles said he paid 600 shekels of gold, two very different sums of money. While there are various opinions regarding the modern value of ancient shekels, the Illustrated Bible Dictionary conservatively estimates that the silver shekel was worth only about 60 cents, while the gold shekel was worth about $8. At these values, David's 50 silver shekels would equal $30, while 600 gold shekels would be worth about $4,800. Others put a higher rate on the shekels, valuing the 50 silver shekels at around $1,000 and the 600 gold shekels close to $600,000.
Whatever the actual values may be, one thing is for sure. Samuel and Chronicles present vastly different sums. So how do we settle up with such a dramatic discrepancy? While many liberal scholars and skeptics accuse the chronicler of purposely inflating the price, a closer look at these passages reveals that there is absolutely no miscalculation in the biblical text whatsoever. Pay close attention to the details. Samuel says that David paid 50 silver shekels for the threshing floor and the oxen, but Chronicles says that David paid 600 gold shekels for the place. The reason that each passage gives a different sum of money is because each passage records a separate purchase. The 50 shekels reported in Samuel only paid for the threshing floor and oxen, which was a small area of land only about 30 by 60 feet. But the 600 shekels in Chronicles was the purchase price for the entire property, which was a much larger area. This conclusion is confirmed only a few verses later in 1 Chronicles 22 verse 1, which explains that David had bought the land with the intent of building the temple on it. And based on the dimensions of the temple, this land had to be at minimum 10,000 square feet. Thus, there is no mistake. David purchased the threshing floor and oxen for 50 silver shekels, plus the entire site for 600 gold shekels. So when we pay attention to the details, we realize that these two passages are recording two separate purchases. Samuel records David's smaller purchase of the threshing floor and oxen, while Chronicles records David's acquisition of the entire surrounding region. It's always important to pay attention to those details. Yeah, the, the devil can be in the details if we don't pay attention to it. That's very good, Ryan. Excellent. All right. Corey, go yeah. for it. First Chronicles 21. I'm also focusing on that and the threshing floor of Ornan. What a wild history this is. I want to focus in on the physical act of threshing, firstly, because we're told that Ornan, when when before he sees the angel of the Lord, he and his sons are threshing wheat on their threshing floor in ancient Jerusalem. So where would this have been? What even is this? Take a look. In the Bible, harvest time is referenced both as an actual practice and as a useful metaphor. Ancient Israel was an agricultural society. Their very survival depended on farming innovations and consistency. So when the time of reaping their produce came, it was an occasion for great celebration and joy as much as for hard work. The production of cereal grains has been called the backbone of ancient Israelite society and was largely composed of wheat and barley. Let's look at the wheat harvest as a model of harvesting and threshing. The wheat harvest took place during the summer and could overlap with the beginning of the grape harvest, making it a very busy and happy time of year. The reaping of wheat came first and could be done by hand or sickle, if by hand the entire plant would be pulled up from the roots. To reap large fields of wheat, whole teams of people would normally be employed. A foreman would oversee the work, and reapers would make their way through the fields armed with sickles of flint or metal, cutting the stalks either halfway, leaving some of the plants still standing as straw for animals to eat or for collection for different use. Wheat stalks could also be cut closer to the head of grain to minimize the work of winnowing later on. After the reapers would come teams of young men and women who would organize the cut stalks into piles and tie them into bundles called sheaves. Once the reaping was completed, the sheaves would be carried to the threshing floor. The location of threshing floors would likely have varied from area to area as they needed to be in windy locations. Here, the stalks of wheat were turned into three products of varying worth, grain, straw, and chaff. The first step of processing the wheat was to cut the plant up to separate the valuable grain seeds from the plant stalks. This could be done by threshing stick, animal, threshing sledge, or threshing wheel. Threshing sticks wielded by harvesters would be used to beat smaller amounts of grain, maybe even for a quick meal or on products that had smaller seeds. Animals like oxen, with or without metal shoes, could be driven over the plants to crush them into pieces. Effective threshing sledges were also drawn by animals. They were boards inlaid with sharp stones and metal to chop the plants. And threshing wheels were carts made with rows of stone and metal inlaid wheels to accomplish the same. The chopped up wheat was then winnowed. 
Using wooden fork-like shovels, harvesters would throw the mixture high into the air to catch the wind. The different weights of the products meant that the wind would carry them different distances. The light and nearly useless chaff would be carried the farthest, the straw would fall closer to the harvester, and the valuable heavy grain would fall closest to them. The grain would be tossed up for another chance at blowing away remaining chaff and then passed through a few sieves before being measured for taxation and stored for human consumption. So there we go. This was this was normally a joyful time, the, the threshing and the winnowing, and Ornan clearly had a very prime location in ancient Jerusalem, but can we take a second and acknowledge poor Ornan and his sons? His eyes are all of a sudden opened and he sees, not only does he see the angel of the Lord, this angelic being, but the angel of the Lord is in a very aggressive stance. He has a drawn weapon. Like we don't use swords today. We would more, like I, I think a, a, an equivalent would be something like a gun or something. We see the angel of the Lord in a very, very aggressive stance. Meanwhile, there's a pestilence going on in Jerusalem and you know that people are dying. And I love it because it says his four sons went and hid. So did he yell like, get out of here guys. And then he's just what, standing, standing there, there waiting for King. No wonder when he saw King David walking up, he ran over and fell on his face. <laughs> Save me from whatever well, this yeah. is, I mean, David. Think about it. I mean, I mean, the angel, everybody talks about seeing angels and they've got this greatness, but what about seeing an angel that's who's angry? Aggressive. Yeah. Armed. And he's armed. And, Reminds and now, me of the Balaam's donkey back in mm. Numbers 22. I mean, seriously, I mean, even the donkey said, okay, that's it. You know, he even talked to <laughs> It doesn't Balaam. take a genius to know when you're in danger, right? Well, of course it doesn't. And when there's a weapon involved. When there's a weapon. You yeah. know, and a lot of yeah. people are talking today about seeing angels, and some people are talking about going to heaven and all that. But we come back to the Bible, and we have all that we need about heaven from the Bible. And if we read the Bible and pay attention to it, that becomes interesting. But when it becomes very informative, but when we allow ourselves to be swept away into these other people's experiences, they can draw any kind of picture they want and we would believe it, thinking that we're doing God's will. You know, God's will is coming back to the scripture, understanding what he said, because these are his words. Mm -hmm. You know, these are English translation of his words, but these are not our words, men's words. And Peter says it's by the Holy Spirit when they came upon, when he came upon men and they wrote it out. So it's very important for us to remember that we need to read the Bible. So I want to encourage you to read the Bible with us. If you haven't done that, then let me be the first to say to you, do it read the Bible. That's most important. That's the number one reason, because in the word of God is Jesus Christ. He is fully God and fully man. He gave his life, died on the cross, and rose again. He then ascended, rose in the physical flesh, seen by over 500 men, according to the Bible. He then ascended to heaven. And you know, that's the only thing in heaven from earth is God, Jesus Christ. That's amazing. You stop and think about that. That's amazing. So read the Bible and learn about him. Now we're going to continue on. We're going to, around late September, early October, we'll be in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So that'll be good. But anyway, that's, that's my challenge today. Read the Bible. Okay. Speaking of challenges, go. Well, <laughs> before we speak of this challenge, we should... Um let you talk about weekend what program. you and Matlock do on the weekend. Sure. So Matlock, my husband, and I host uh, Bible Discoveries, the weekend show. So we release it on Friday with the idea that you can watch it anytime over the weekend at your leisure. And it covers the entire week's of the entire week's reading. So if you're reading through the Bible with us, uh, everything that you were supposed to read that week, we we deal with. So we talk about issues that pop up as we're reading through the scripture that we don't have time to talk about here on The Daily Show. And our favorite thing is interacting with your questions and comments, questions that are emailed to us, questions uh, mainly drawn from the comment section on our YouTube videos uh, because The Weekend Show is released on YouTube. So you can just go to YouTube and search my name, Corey Babechko, and you can 
can find our channel if you're interested. Yeah, and just subscribe to it because that's yeah. how people can, how it can grow and all of that. So that's very good. And uh, we've only got a minute 42. So go ahead with your question. All right, here we go. So anywhere from 2 Kings chapter 20 through to 1 Chronicles chapter 21, if you're new to the program, at the end of every week, I take a question from all of the reading that we have done in the last six days. So here we are. After the death of his father, King Hezekiah, how old was Manasseh when he became king? So the question boils down to how old was Manasseh when he became king? Was he 10? Was he 12? Or was he 15? 10? 12 or 15. <laughs> you know, it's always good when you're, what you think, <laughs> it, shows it, it up. shows up in the answer. <laughs> yeah. It makes you a more, a little bit more a confident. More, a little more confident. What you think. Because sometimes multiple choice is not easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? The it's trick harder. is saying what you think is right first and then seeing if it gets verified see. by the multiple choice. True enough. That's a tip. I don't know if it's a good tip, but that's what me and Ryan try to do. <laughs> yep. Do you All have right, an answer? So do you, we do. All right. So you're confident? Very. That? So how old was Manasseh when he became king? He was a young guy. Manasseh was 12. All right. He now, became king. those of you at home, you can check it out in 2 Kings 21, verse 1. We're going to read this and see if Ryan and Corey were correct here on the program and also you at home. All right. 2 Kings 21, verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hepzibah. So that is the answer. If you said 12 years old, great job. Uh, I put together six sermons from Zechariah. It's a great prophet about the end of time. This is the first half that I'm going to offer to you. And we'd like to, to let you know about that. And you can do so by going to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, BibleDiscoveryTV.com, or call us or write us, and uh, we'll give you that information. Let's pray today. Lord, I want to thank you for forgiving me. Help me to forgive those who have sinned against me as you told us to pray in Jesus' name, amen.